Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni muli wanji, namaste, jambo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're part of our beautiful Reading with Your Kids family. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is coming to us from the United Kingdom. It's Corinna Turner. And she is here to celebrate her middle grade YA title, The Boy Who Knew. Before we invite Corinna into the studio, I want to give a big shout out to all my friends in the East Boston branch of the Boston Public Library, the oldest municipally funded branch of the library in the country. I love the East Boston branch of the Boston Public Library. It is one of my favorite places in the world. I love performing there. It brings me back to my old neighborhood. East Boston is such an amazing neighborhood, such a diverse, beautiful neighborhood. And I just had the chance to perform once again for the families of the East Boston Public Library. Not in person, unfortunately, but a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful virtual performance. And I just loved it. And I had such a great time. So thank you so much for the families who, who showed up for our virtual performance. Thank you so much for the folks at the library. I can't wait to be back there live and in person. If you are interested in hosting a performance of my program, The Magic Between Us is Respect and Kindness, you can learn more about it by going to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on Parents, click here, scroll on down to where it says Live Events. Joining us right now from the United Kingdom, she is here to celebrate her brand new middle grade YA novel, The Boy Who Knew, Carlo Acutis. Please welcome back to the show, Karina Turner. Karina, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Karina was part of the uh, of our Christmas 2020 episode that I entitled Christmas Lights. We invited uh, a number of, of um, Catholic teen authors to come onto the show, and they agreed to write... An original, write and read an original short story. And the way they created it, I gave them a prompt, and then each author had a section to write in. It started with our friend Les- Leslie Wall. She wrote this first section and handed it off to the second author. And it wasn't a typical, typical collaboration where authors would get back and, and discuss where the story was going. It was more like a, a live improvisational exercise where the authors were just kind of required to say yes and, and just to pick up where the first author left off and then move the story forward and then pass it along. And it was a, a beautiful outcome. And Karina's contribution, I'm not, we're not going to give it away, but, but, but her contribution really was an unexpected twist that was, was, was magical. It really, um, made the story and, and drove the story in a, completely different and unexpected and beautiful uh, direction. So, um, yeah, I just want to encourage everybody to check out that episode. It's called Christmas Lights. It was originally published on December 25th, 2020. Um, Karina, I'm excited to have you back on. You have a a fantastic um, collection of of books that you've published. why don't we start by asking you to tell us all about who Carlo Acutis is and, and about this novel, The Boy Who Knew. Yeah, um, Carlo Acutis is the very first millennial blessed. He was only um, beatified in October. He was born in 2001 in London, so um, the Brits are quite excited about him because he was actually born in the UK. Uh, he did move very um, at a very young age back to Italy, uh, where he grew up as a fairly normal only child um, except being extremely uh, holy um, lovely boy and sadly when he was 15 he um, got a very acute leukemia and died only a week after the diagnosis but in such a 
prayerful, peaceful, accepting way that he completely um, comforted his parents, especially his mother. And um, now uh, he has been beatified. And everyone's hoping he will be canonized as well. Yeah. Now, a lot of people who are listening and aren't Catholic probably have heard the expression saints, and they, they may be familiar with St. Patrick or St. Francis, some of the uh, superstars of the communion of saints. Uh, but, <laughs> but a lot of people don't really understand what we mean, uh, I being a Catholic myself, but what we, what we mean when we talk about uh, a person who has been named a saint, and a lot, even a lot of folks in the church may not understand the difference between a blessed and a saint, and uh, can you explain a little bit about that tradition? Yes, certainly. Um Obviously, there are vast numbers more saints in heaven um, mm-hmm. than the ones that we uh, call saints, um, because anyone who's in heaven is technically a saint. But the ones we name saints are the ones that the church has sort of um, received evidence um, from the Holy Spirit are definitely saints. And of these saints, um, if you're trying to figure out if someone is a saint, if the church is trying to figure it out, First of all, um, if uh, a whole load of people say, we think this person is um, you know, a saint, they're in heaven, the church will open an investigation, and at that point the person will be called um, a servant of God, that's the official title, and if they decide that the investigation uh, looks like it's got um, good, good evidence to go forward, they'll then be declared venerable, so that's like the next um, stage, and then if... Um, they decide all the all the evidence is very 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 strong that this person is in heaven and if there is a miracle then the person will probably be beatified and be called blessed and at this point they need um, a second miracle sort of the absolute final proof from god and after that they can be canonized it's slightly different if someone has been martyred there is less um, requirement for miracles I won't get too technical. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, a lot of people might be listening to this and think, oh, so Carlo um, Carlo created a, 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 a miracle. Carlo caused a miracle to happen. That's not quite what we believe. Am I right about that? Yes, that's correct. Um, what, what Catholics believe is if you um, ask a saint, Um, to pray for you the same way that you would ask your friend to pray for you or your um, priest or or some nuns to pray for you, Um, then Carlo will will pray to God and say, you know, please help so-and-so. And And, um, God will decide whether to grant Carlo's prayers. And if he grants the prayers, then you have a miracle. Kind of like... It's definitely God doing the miracles. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And and I think that's... That's important because I, I know there's a lot of misunderstandings out there um, because I think a lot of folks believe that uh, with the, that folks who call themselves Catholic, you know, they just believe that they, they have this, uh, you know, kind of um, they have, they've God and they have Jesus and the Holy Spirit and this whole pantheon of, of minor gods that we call saints. Yes, I think there's a lot of confusion, partly because of the word um, pray. Mm-hmm. Catholics sometimes say they're going to pray to a saint. And historically, the word pray just meant ask. So you'd say, I, I pray you give me some bread to your friend, and they would give you some bread. And um, in sort of general society, it has come to mean only talking to God. Like when you pray, you are talking to God. Um, and not to another person. But Catholics have continued to use it in the sense of talking to another person um, when talking about the saints. And this causes a lot of confusion, because when you say you're going to pray to a saint, you actually just mean you're going to ask a saint, you're going to talk to a saint um, the way you would talk to your friend. Mm -hmm. So I think this is where part of the confusion has come from, really. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. absolutely. (laughs) Well, I think that's important, because I think, too, a lot of Catholics forget that and, and, and don't quite understand it, because... You know, for for a lot of Catholics, their you know their faith formation kind of ends at a very young age, and, and it doesn't continue um, throughout our our lives, which is 
kind of what what should happen with with everything that we're interested in. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, it would be really silly for somebody who wants to be a writer to stop their learning when they're twelve to sixteen years old. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, it's, it's a big problem yeah. nowadays. Yeah. yeah. So, what is it? Uh, why I, I understand like uh, color cutis. This is a, a a wonderful subject for a biography, but um, this is something uh, a, a passion, a ministry of yours to to write Catholic um, uh, Catholic literature. Why did you chose this path for yourself as an author? Uh, do you mean Carlo Cutis specifically, or just uh, all, all of your work? All of my work. Uh, well, I I have always had um, a gift for writing fiction and and a sort of a calling to write fiction. Uh, when I was younger, I was mostly writing fiction directed towards the mainstream. Um, eventually, I just got fed up with doing that because it felt like. To have any chance in the mainstream, you had to sort of keep all the religion out of it. You know, you, you don't do God. You had to keep it very, um, very secular, basically. And eventually, I just got fed up with that. And um, I had the idea for my novel, I Am Margaret, when I was on retreat in a convent. I had it in a dream. And I just thought, you know, I'm just going to write this book the same way I would write a mainstream novel, but I'm going to just allow the faith into the book. Um, and that's what I did, and I haven't really looked back. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Now, what was it about other than just the fact that uh, that you had that connection with Carlo being born in in the UK? What was it specifically about him and his story that um, inspired you to write this? Well, I've been hearing about him a bit online for for a while, but I hadn't sort of paid a massive amount of attention. It was just like, oh, you know, he sounds really good. I'm glad he's being beatified. Um, and then my friend said to me, oh, why don't you write a book about him? And to start with, I was like, ha, ah, have you seen the list of books I want to write? You know, you've got to be joking. Um, but then um, I, I kept thinking about it. And um, and the more I thought about it, the more I could see, you know, what a really um, good example he was for young people and for, and for adults and for everyone, really. And um, the Holy Spirit put the idea into my head um, of this, this story. It's um, a biography through fiction. So... Um, it's in a framing narrative about a, a young 2020 boy who's 15 and he's just been diagnosed with leukemia. And throughout the book, um, he, he's constantly learning about Blessed Carlo and developing a friendship with him and um, coming to terms with his own diagnosis. So in the end, I just I just thought I've got to do this. So I wrote it. <laughs> yeah, really cool. And, and that, too, brings up going back to our discussion earlier about you know what Catholics believe uh, about saints. Um, the saints are, are, are examples for us, uh, not of not of folks to worship, but f- of folks to kind of understand and, uh, and and look to and draw inspiration from, and and um, uh, hopefully understand that. That, that we're not perfect. Carla wasn't perfect. Um, Saint Augustine wasn't perfect. But but just like them, we can we can model our lives after them and grow closer to each other and go, grow closer to God um, through their example. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You. I, I mentioned the fact that you have this fantastic, uh, you know, library of, of books that you've written. I'm really fascinated buy them uh you have a, a number of books that are based uh have have dinosaurs in them um yeah. I, i'm i'm really curious of, about that can you tell us a little bit about that series yes that series is called unsparked um and um that that's a reference to the slang for electricity spark is the slang in their world um it's set in the future um there are there are dinosaurs roaming the world uh, basically it's a sort of um the scenario where the scientists managed to recreate dinosaurs and, and then, oops, um, they've all escaped and <laughs> can't really be contained anymore. So we'd all better go and live behind fences, um, with big electric fences around all the cities. Um, but there are some people who actually still live outside, unsparked, uh, as the slang is. And uh, the, the series is about a, a farming family, particularly the two teenagers, um, Daryl and Harry, and also um, a young hunter, who lives out in a sort of armoured RV 
um, without any electric fence at all. The farmers have their own little fence. Joshua has no electric fence. He just lives in this um, vehicle, hunting and capturing dinosaurs mostly. And it's about their adventures. Um, I don't want to give it We'll give away too much of the plot, but uh, at the beginning, um, Daryl and Harry's father has just remarried because their mother died quite a long time ago, and he's going to take his new bride back to the farm, but she's a city lady, and things don't go quite according to plan on the journey. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm imagining, wow, um, a, a world where 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 you know scientists discover something, and oh boy... Uh, what are we going to do now? We have this great thing. We thought it was a great thing, and wow, it's taken on a life of its own. Yes, the series is actually set many, many decades after the uh, the accident. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, so they're all very. It's all very well established, you know, that you you, you hide in the city, and the big things with teeth wander around out there, and these crazy people possibly live out there as well, but. You know, us sensible city people will live in the city, um, and those farmers and hunters can just sort of do what they like out there. You know, um, so so yes, it, it's um, so it's not so much about it going wrong. It, it's more that that is the the world they are living in. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm curious. You you were mentioning that that the the um, uh, the boy who knew Carlo Cutis is uh, the first in a series of books you hope to write about the saints. Uh, what other saints are you um, looking to write about? Yes, well, I've I've got some. I am I'm trying to sort of firm up the list at the moment. It will definitely be um, Saint Ignatius of Antioch is definitely on the list. Um, I'm trying to think who else is definitely on the list already. Um, Blessed Chiara Badano, I think, and um, soon to be Blessed Sandra Sabatini. And St. Raphael, the Archangel. Ah. And there's a few others that I, I don't want to name because I'm not quite certain yet. I'm just sort of firming up the first sequence of books at the moment. One of the things that, that we talk about here on, on the show a lot is just the value and the benefits of families reading together. And a lot of times when, when people hear uh, the expression, you know, reading with your kids, they immediately think of reading with their three or four or five year five year olds, and they don't think about reading together either aloud or co reading with their tweens and their teens. It's like, oh, you know, kids are those kids are reading on their own. They don't need help for the most part. They don't want to, you know, read uh, with me. They don't want to read aloud with me. They don't want to talk about uh, a book, and I don't want to read a teen book. But there's a lot of value in in co-reading together with our kids and then talking about the books. What value do you see uh, of families, especially families um, who have a strong faith and, and parents wanting to instill that faith or share that faith with their young people. How important is it, do you think, that, that families read books that, that have messages of faith with their kids? I, I think it's very important uh, because if, if you're reading books books with your kids, you can, you can discuss, you can, you can get a feel for how different people in the family are, are reacting and, um, and you, you know that your, your kids are at least sort of reading, reading something sound. Um, cause not all, not all parents have time to sort of pre-read everything. Some parents mm-hmm. do, some parents don't. Um, and if they don't, then the kids could be reading a lot of other stuff. But if they're reading some books together, then the parents you know, know they're at least reading those books together. Mm-hmm. And I think also if you're reading books together and it's intergenerational, then you've got the benefit of all the different um, generational views. So, you know, the parents are going to be hearing the children's reactions and the, the children are going to be getting the parents' perspective. And I think it's just very enriching and it keeps people very connected to one another. I yeah. love I love that idea that, that reading together that it, it, it allows it allows kids and parents to 
experience the story, experience the, the book through uh, inter, you know, a, a number of generational lenses and perspectives. Mm. It's not quite the same thing, but it just puts into my head. Do you know why um, monks and nuns, when they're um, in the chapel, in, in what they call the choir, uh, praying the divine office, why they are facing one another in two lines? Do you know why? I don't. It's because they are they are preaching to one another. They are preaching the word of God to one another, back and forth, back and forth between the two sides. That's why they switch lines. Oh wow, that's cool! Yeah. I was not aware of that. Um, talk to to uh, a, a little bit more, Karina, about this idea of reading with our kids, especially reading books about faith. Uh, you know, if if you're looking, if you're a parent and you, you have this strong belief and you believe that, that your faith has really strengthened you and helped you get, you know, face certain challenges and, and helped you live a better life, how much more effective do you think uh, sharing in, in, in that faith and teaching that faith is through discussions about story as it is to preaching uh, and, and just sitting down and, and you know, just kind of wagging your fingers. You got to go to church. You got to believe in this way. Uh, well, pers- personally, I think um, teaching through story is is usually more effective than preaching. Um, pre- preaching is very important. I'm a lay Dominican. We are an order of preachers, so <laughs> I am not knocking preaching. But um, when you teach through stories, um, people remember things better. Um, most people do. Uh, Jesus, of course, taught through stories all the time. He taught through parables. Um, he didn't tend to just stand there and, and say, I'm going to give you a philological lecture now. Mm-hmm. Um, he would always say, and I'm going to tell you a parable. Um, so I think there's a, there's a great value in that. And also, if, if you're sort of teaching through a story and you're reading it as well, you're sort of practicing what you're preaching. So you're not just saying, uh, re- read, read this um, edifying book. You know, and then you go off and you you read like um, you know some some secular novel. You know, you're 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 reading it along with the person you're you're trying to teach something to. Yeah. Um, so you're also setting an example. Yeah. 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 And and and, and there's a, a great lesson I've heard too in the past that one of the greatest ways to kind of develop a skill. And to perfect it is to teach it to somebody else. And in doing that, you're also learning about that skill, that lesson yourself. Yes, I've certainly heard that, and I think it's I think it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you have this uh, series of, of books about saints. Uh, you have this the great the unsparked series. Uh, are, are is there another? Airy, do you have another idea of a series that that you that you're co- contemplating or working on? Uh, I do have a few other things out already, actually. Um, my my first series, um, which is my longest series, is in fact um, the I Am Margaret series, and that's a dystopian series set in a, a future um, Europe where there's an atheist government um, that suppresses religion, and also they've got an extreme um, eugenics program, so the teenagers get tested when they're 18 and if they're not sufficiently perfect they get used for basically forcible organ donation so that's quite a sort of serious dystopian um, series and I've also got um, a couple of fantasy novels Uh, there's one which I tend to describe as rural fantasy as opposed to urban fantasy because it's set in the countryside and that's about um, (laughs) a half sheep girl um, going to school for the first time going to senior school and how she fits in and she meets a rather strange boy who t- keeps disappearing at the full moon um so the question is should they be friends um and is that going to work out um that, that's quite a nice book it's it's um main theme is about um the fact that you can't help what you are but you can help what you do um and it sort of touches very gently on the dangers of um genetic manipulation obviously um and then I have a another book called um, Elfling, which is a historical fantasy. It's a bit sort of like um, Tolkien in Elizabethan London. Um, that that was came first for teen fiction in the Catholic Press Awards uh, a couple of years ago. And then I think 
the last oh no there's um i've got a novella called sunday which is is quite an adult novella um suitable for the for mature teens but not for um any any other teens and that's a retelling of the kidnapping of the Chibok schoolgirls in Nigeria um, in 2014, but it's set in um, the UK. So the idea is to, to sort of help the reader to understand what it really feels like when it's happening to girls in your country. And that's sold in aid of Age of the Church in Need. And then I think the last book to mention is, uh, yes, um, Three Last Things or The Hounding of Carl Jarold, Soulless Assassin. That's another novella, and that's for adults, um, although there's nothing actually um, objectionable in it for teenagers. And that's about a um, assassin on death row um, on the day of his execution. And he doesn't think such a thing as love exists, and he's been very resistant to uh, Father Jacob trying to persuade him that it does. And uh, his time is up, so what's, is he going to figure it out in time? That's that one. Wow. Oh, and there's the play of Iowa Margaret as well, which um, is good for schools and youth groups and things. So much coming from our friend Karina Turner. Hey, Karina, where can folks go online to connect with you and to get a deeper look at everything that we've talked about here today? Yes, um, my books can be found on Amazon or on um, pretty much any bookstore. Um, you can also go onto my website, which is www. Uh, I am Margaret.com. And you can also find my books on Catholic Teen Books, um, dot com. So, yeah, if you go to any of those places, you can find out quite a bit and read reviews. And, uh, Excellent. Yeah. Well, we've had a great time speaking to the author of The Boy Who Knew, Carlos Acutis, and so much more. And, and our guest has been Karina Turner. Karina, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. It's been lovely to talk to you. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Jane Yolen. She is the author of over 400 published children's books. Her insight into children's literature, into life, is just amazing. I had so much fun speaking with Jane you don't want to miss this episode. Be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast to make sure that you don't miss this next episode. If you are an author, you don't want to miss it. If you're a parent, you don't want to miss it. If you're breathing, you don't want to miss our interview with Jane Yolen. That's the next episode of the podcast. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to start by thanking our guest, Corinna Turner. Be sure to check out The Boy Who Knew. I also want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, Hannah Pat Oboiski, Alexia Brown. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.